Warning, warning, this podcast contains spoilers. Listen at your own risk. Welcome to Medium Shift, the podcast that investigates how stories stack up from medium to medium through the adaptation process. In today's episode, we continue our Arachnophilmia, title pending, series on the Spider-Man remakes, reboots, and redoings. In today's episode, we specifically focus on Spider-Man 3. Yeah, dig on this. And we're back. (laughs) My name is Chris. And I'm Ev. And this episode, we are indeed uh, capping off the Raimi trilogy of Spider-Man films with the, I think it's fair to say, infamous Spider-Man 3. Obviously, continuing on as a direct sequel from Spider-Man 2, uh, this movie was a significant success, uh, but the last film that Raimi was to make with Sony... Uh, for reasons that are probably going to become clear in this episode. So, Ev, what are your thoughts on Spider-Man 3? After coming back to rewatch it for this podcast, I'd have to say I don't hate it as much as I thought I did. Yes. Yes. Join the dark side. <laughs> and I don't even mean that in an ironic sense. I mean, some of the stuff in this is actually quite good. Yes, it was overly complicated. Yes, they had too many villains in. Yes, that whole Eddie Brock subplot was Mm god-awful. But there was some really great stuff in it. I really like everything with Sandman. I'm disappointed that he lacks so much in this film because his whole storyline was really good. And his origin was some of the best, like, CGI I've seen. Incredible. Even today, by contemporary standards, I think it's really incredible. Yeah. And the fact that this movie is now 13 years old really said something. Yeah, so I do actually think there's some good in this. It's just hampered down by a lot of crap that gets memefied, and then those memes just sort of take over. Mm-hmm. I, I am never going to be able to look at Black Suit Spider-Man again without <laughs> thinking of jazz hands. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, um... See, that's kind of the thing. Like, Spider-Man 3 is not thought of as Spider-Man 3 anymore. It is thought of as the emo Peter Parker movie. I mean, like, that image has kind of come to define the legacy of the movie, and I think in a really weird way. But I am, with you, this is potentially one of the most controversial opinions I've had regarding superhero movies. But I think Spider-Man 3 is just okay. I think it is a collection of really good scenes and really bad scenes. And sure, like, the bad definitely outweighs the good, but you take out those individual components, there is a really decent and compelling movie kind of meshed up in the the madness of subplots and villains that this movie is. The Sandman stuff, I think you're absolutely right, is fantastic. I think some of the stuff with the new Goblin or Harry Osborn yeah. is really good, excluding the temporary amnesia subplot, which... I don't even know why it's in there, considering it lasts, what, half an hour at that? So yeah. It seems to only be in there so they could have that scene where they have lunch together. And mm. Harry slash James Franco can give that smarmy grin and wink at the end. God, yeah, he does that a lot, doesn't he? There are... He has multiple... They, there. I, this is the other thing I never remember as well. Obviously, everyone remembers the jazz, black suit, Peter dance sequence. But also, there's like... Us, they dance to do the twist when they're making an omelette or something like that. Yep. Which, like, yep, sure. But, I mean, look, obviously, there's a lot in this movie that I cannot defend. But I will say that there are... I, I definitely think that there are some redeeming elements. And seeing this as a kid, I kind of thought that the same way. Like, Spider-Man 2 was always my go-to. But there were definitely bits and pieces of this that I would just rewatch over and over again. Like, I've seen that fight between Black Suit and Spider-Man and Sandman in the sewers... Like, so many times, I think that's really fantastic. I think the really o- the opening fight sequence between um, Peter when he's unclothed, when he's not dressed as Spider-Man with the new Goblin, mm. is fantastic as well. I think the third act has some merit to it, even despite the venomness of it all. I actually like that little scene at the end where he's taking down the symbiote, like, itself, and using the 
like mm. metal poles and the ringing and the mm. running yeah. around. That's very classic comics. Yeah. Yeah. It's just the lead up to that does not mm. justify it happening. No, no, definitely. Not. And nothing around Eddie Brock in this movie justifies him being in here. Like they no. get it. Uh, aside so from Topher Grace, I just, any excuse to have Topher Grace. Yeah, look, I like Topher Grace, but I just don't think he's... He's kind of like Kirsten Dunst in that he's just not given anything to work with. Yeah. Like, I think... We'll get into this definitely regarding the sources, but I think they kind of come from the complete wrong direction of introducing and portraying Eddie Brock, and it just butchers oh, yes. the character. Yeah, absolutely. Talking exclusively about Topher Grace's performance in that mm. particular scene. The character shouldn't have been there, but I'm a little grateful that I got to see... Topher Grace just going, my spider sense is tingling, if you know what I mean. <laughs> if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and just clearly, like, he seemed to be having a bit too much fun. Yeah. In some he, of those moments. I just, I can't take him seriously in any of those scenes because of the teeth. Like, oh, yeah, I no, think his no, face no. looks horrendous. And, like, not threatening at all. He looks like, he, he just looks like the guy with a bit of, like, tar on his face and, like, some bad dental work. Yeah. I just like, oh, I definitely like Topher Grace and some other stuff. And as we kind of talked in, I think in or talking about the original Spider-Man film, I think he would have been a really interesting Peter Parker with some good material mm. to go off. But I just think he is, he is the wrong choice. I think the the way they introduce Eddie Brock and the way they characterize Eddie Brock and just almost everything regarding the symbiote in this movie, I think is really kind of poorly done. Like, yeah. um, which I don't think is a big surprise. Like it doesn't feel like there's really much of a heart in it, which there wasn't like, Sam, we'll, we'll get into the production stuff, but Sam Raimi didn't initially want Venom in this movie. He did it to appease uh, the producers like Sony and Ivy Arad and things like that. So I think the movie would be infinitely better if all of that was just completely cut, which I don't think is an uncommon opinion. But that doesn't take away from the fact that like the stuff with Sam and some of the stuff with Goblin is actually, I think, really good. Hot take. Spider-Man 3 is more than just Tobey Maguire doing like jazz hands and fingers at every woman he sees on the street, which is just... <sighs> Yeah, I know a whole thing, and I can't defend it, but... <laughs> you bring up that jazz scene. I do find it kind of hilarious. It keeps sort of doubling back on itself. It started off as, like, the girls were sort of, like, looking at him all sexy, and at the end, he's also being all confident, and people loving him. But there's a bit in the middle where he's doing that whole jazz thing, sliding around on the street, and the women are looking at him like, what the hell is he doing? Who yeah. is this loser? This he like, seems like a psychopath, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like, as I heard, uh, was it Comic Drake talk about this movie? And he basically described uh, Black Suit Spider-Man as what Peter Parker, a nerd, thinks a cool person would look and act like. I was about to bring that point up. Like, this is, uh, what's his name? Emo Peter Parker is not supposed to be considered a cool person. It is a the image of what an incredibly dorky person thinks a cool person would act like. In the same way, Trump is what a homeless person thinks a really rich person is. <laughs> sure, I guess. It's one hell of an analogy, but... <laughs> Well, he's like, yeah, and I'm going to have my name on all of the buildings and everything will be gold. Mm, and yep. I will have perfect hair <laughs> and the perfect tan all the time. Yep. I mean, like, if anything, Tobey Maguire has, it's definitely that perfect hair, like that kind of like <laughs> flop down he has. God, there's that the one scene that I can't get over is when, like, after a fight, I don't remember the exact moment or something, but when he looks himself in, like, a piece of glass on the street or something like that in a mirror. And he like pulls his hair down for a moment <laughs> and he's like, wait, no, what am I doing? And then it immediately flips it back. I'm like, Oh, it's, <laughs> it's just dumb. It's just <laughs> real, really dumb. It's a terrible look. I'm sorry. Do you not tie your personality and morality to the way you do your hair? That's how I feel every morning. <laughs> I get out of the shower and suddenly I'm trying to work out if I'm going to kill someone. <laughs> <laughs> it immediately starts raining or something like that. And you just see your hair puffing up. It's like, oh, well, I guess I'm going to kill someone on my way home. Yeah, no, it's look, it's not. It's not good. It's not good at all. And I don't know. We're, we're, is there anything else generally you want to talk about Spider-Man 3 before we get into the production and references? Uh, nah, let's just jump into it. <laughs> yep, cool. So obviously, big success after Spider-Man 2. Spider-Man 2 was a massive, massive hit financially as well. The budget on this is even bigger than Spider-Man 2. I believe at the time it was the most expensive movie ever made. 
until it was eclipsed by the next Pirates of the Caribbean film, which was either this year or the year after, I don't quite recall. But either way, it was hugely expensive. Uh, because of the uh, massive success, um, Avi Arad and a lot of the other producers started to push for other popular characters to be added in, which is how um, Venom ended up being included and Gwen Stacy as well. I think it kind of shows in the final product and that both of them are, I wouldn't say shoehorned in there, but there is so much stuff going on in this movie that they just feel like another unnecessary layer on top. The original script, actually, I thought was quite interesting reading up on this, but um, it was originally going to have the Vulture as the villain, uh, with Ben Kingsley attached to play him, which I think would have been great casting. I really would have liked to see that, quite frankly. Yeah, no, I really would like to see that as well. I think that'd be cool. I mean, mm. we did eventually get a really cool Vulture, eventually, but mm. I reckon Pink Ben Kingsley would have done a pretty awesome job. Uh, Way better the job than you did of uh, the Mandarin. Well, well, the Mandarin's a whole whole different beast. Let's not let's not yes. bring that up. But um, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure what kind of version of Vulture they would do because it almost feels like a conglomerate of the Green Goblin and Doc Ock in the previous film, and like kind of an aged scientist who uses like a mechanical suit that they designed to commit crimes. Like, I would be a little bit concerned that they would just reintroduce uh, Adrian Toomes as like another mentor to Peter or something like that. Uh, like, yeah, yeah. It kind of felt in. It kind of felt a little bit too familiar to the other villains that they'd already done. But that being said, like Sandman as well, which is obviously a radically different character. What I thought was interesting as well is that um, an early draft of this film regarding the symbiote had a similar subplot of um John Jameson, who people will recall that uh, Mary Jane left at the eye, at the aisle in the aisle altar. at the at, the, at altar. the altar. That's that's the word. Yeah, good. Um, left at the altar at the end of Spider Man Two was going to come back to Earth in a shuttle because he has, he's an astronaut with the symbiote attached to it, uh, which is how it happens in the Spider-Man animated series in the 90s. And but they ended later up... on in the Venom series, in yep. the Venom yep. movie. Yeah, in the Venom movie, yep. And Spectacular Spider-Man, uh, the animated series as well, which I've said it before, I'll say it again, the best version of Spider-Man outside of the comics. Yeah, all of that was streamlined to basically just the symbiote coming down into a meteorite and just conveniently landing near Peter, which... Look, I think considering how cluttered this movie as is, probably the right approach, even if I think the better approach would have just been not to include the symbiote at all. I, obviously, regarding uh, some of the uh, inspirations for this movie, like it draws from a lot, a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> to be frank, if you want to start specifically talking about the symbiote and Venom, obviously Venom has been one of the most popular enduring characters of Spider-Man's Rogue Gallery for a long time. Um, that's which is one of the reasons that Avi Arad and so many other people kind of pushed for him to be included in this film because they thought the popularity was around the character. In the original comic, Peter gets the symbiote costume from Battleworld, which is during the Secret War. Is it Secret War? Yeah, the um, Secret Wars uh, yep. miniseries. Yep, that's right, in the 90s, which is a, basically a big overarching comic event that had a lot of the other characters involved. When a lot that of characters. also had them change costumes as well. Yes, yeah, but it basically involved a lot of people, characters being teleported to what uh, this place called Better World and Outer Space, and then that's where the symbiote kind of comes from. He just finds it at a, at a space station there or something like that. I don't. Yeah, quite no, uh, he gets directed I, by I think it's like Thor and Mister Fantastic to a machine to mm. help repair and redesign his suit, but he goes to the wrong one, and the black mass appears that envelops his body mm. and gives him his new black Spidey suit. Yep. That's which is right. later discovered to be a symbiote. Yep, an alien symbiote. Related, actually, the way that uh, Peter goes to Kirk Connors in this uh, film to like try and find out what exactly he is, uh, that is the role that Reed Richards plays in the original comics, hmm. um, which I think is interesting. Um, a lot of the, the other, obviously the arc of Spider-Man with the black suit goes very familiar when um, basically the black suit was taking over Peter's body when he was sleeping and fighting crime, which is kind of represented in the film by Peter waking up on the side of a building um, which I think it is a good scene. Like, as much as I don't really like the symbiote stuff in this movie, I think the look and the way that the symbiote moves is great. And that opening sequence when, like, he's, like, hanging upside down on the building and the score kicks in for the first time and everything is really nice thematically and I think is the closest it gets to kind of the symbiote arc in the comics. And then at the end, actually, he gets rid of the symbiote in a very f similar way, which is another scene I really like. Um, yes. In the bell tower... Yeah, which is straight out of the comic books. Basically, he mm -hmm. found out that the symbiote was, like, weakened by sound, and so he goes there and rings the bell, and then that's how he manages to get it off, only for the symbiote to bond to Eddie Brock, who is at that church at the exact same time. So that plays out almost exactly the same way, though the motivations 
and the reasoning behind Eddie Brock is radically different in the comics than it is to the film. And this kind of gets to a point that I think is kind of frustrating in that Eddie Brock in this movie is an asshole. He's immediately unlikable from the first yep. time that he's introduced, which I think is a bad idea. I think mm. so many of the best depictions of Eddie Brock, not only in the original comics as well. In the original comics, he is basically a journalist working for the Daily Bugle. Uh, the Daily Globe. Daily. Oh, Daily Globe. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're all dailies. You know what I mean. Yeah. Where basically he um, he mistakes the um, identity of a serial killer known as the Sin Eater going on right now believes it to be this one person only for spider-man to later reveal it was this other person which led to eddie brock losing his job and then started his resentness for spider-man which is when he becomes venom but in this like he he's basically designed to be like the asshole parallel to peter parker which i don't necessarily think is appropriate for the character and also i think kind of undercuts when he becomes Venom too as well, like he's not a decent guy who's just had a bad run of luck and then gets corrupted by this thing. He was already a terrible person who was mm. cheating and lying about the photos he was taking before he gets infected by an alien symbiote. There's no arc, there's no like fall from grace or anything like that. He's already a prick. Yeah. And I just, I don't like it. And I think it's a bad, it's a bad take, basically. Yeah, no, I do agree with you 100% on those points it also really sucks that because there was no fall for grace and because there's no sequel to this and because for some reason eddie brock decides to jump into the suit while it explodes at the end mm -hmm. like a hero <laughs> which not even a hero it's more just like i mean obviously the symbiote is like a metaphor for addiction yeah. and him basically jumping into the symbiote at the end is the equivalent of someone going oh I got free of alcoholism, but I think I'm just going to go straight back to it and kill myself yep. now. So, which is not nice at all. No. Once again, zero redemption. And it really leads to what I hate, which is some of the best stuff of Eddie Brock is stuff he does after the Venom suit. That when too. When he yep. like, becomes anti-Venom or Toxin briefly. Mm. Or s many of the other dealings he has with symbiotes. <laughs> yeah. yeah my God, much. He, they just all seem to surround him. Yeah, I mean, there's a point. There's a point he when he becomes a philanthropist as well, mm. um, and no, when he gets cancer and then he becomes a philanthropist because of that, which is what leads to anti venom and everything like that. Um, but yeah, we don't see any of that in this movie, obviously, because they just love killing off their villains, except for yeah. Sandman. Glad he survived. Yeah. He deserves it. He's good. There, curious side note regarding the production as well, but regarding that scene when he gets pulled out of the symbiote at the end. The original version of what they were going to do with that when Peter pulled him out was just basically a pile of bones to come out with a skull. Have you have you seen the behind the scenes stuff of this? Not that. <laughs> yeah, okay. Basically they made a, a skull with the venom teeth. You know how like he's got mm. the really terrible yeah. dentures at the end there. It essentially implies that the symbiote was less of a symbiote and more of a parasite and was eating him alive. And then when Peter pulled him out, it basically pulled out his skeletal structure because that was all that was left of him. But apparently it was, like, basically too deeply traumatizing for test audiences, so they changed it for the final film. Which, like, understandable, but Jesus yeah. Christ, like, that was the most Sam Raimi thing I could have yeah. imagined. I suddenly remembered Sam Raimi as a horror director. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's not really a lot of Sam Raimi touches in this film, either. No. Which I think is kind of disappointing I mean, after there's his daughter, but I don't 2. think that counts. No, not really. As much as I do like that scene, though. Yes. Um, that felt like one of those fun character moments which we were talking about regarding Spider-Man 2. But there's just none of those really, like, kind of stylistic touches or, like, touches of comedy in this movie. Just because it's so overstuffed, like, there's not even mm. any space for them. Literally, I will be totally okay if the entire movie was just J. Jonah Jameson. <laughs> like, all of his scenes put together. Because they were great. Yeah, that's even just the whole trilogy as well. Like yes. you just you could cut the entire trilogy into just a single J. Joe and a Jameson movie, which is just all of his scenes. It's just great. There's he he gets all of the good laughs in this movie as well. Like there's the scene yes. with the bottles too. Yes, the relationship he has with I don't remember the character's name, but Sam Raimi's brother. The guy who's trying to pitch him, uh, like, slogans yeah, yeah. at the very beginning of the movie. <laughs> and there's one point where he says, like, you want a staff job and you want a staff job. Does anyone care what I want? And he walks in and is like, I do. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> Which is just good good stuff. Good stuff. Yes. Yeah. I mean, look, he's always great. We haven't even yeah. talked about J.K. Cinnamons that much in these movies just because he's, like, he's perfect. He's perfect. No, he, like, is. I mean, he is perfect yeah. for the 
Yeah, the absolutely. There's not even that much to say. He like he nails it. Yeah. Look, the fact that of everyone they could have brought back for uh, Spider Man Far From Home, mm-hmm. he's the one they went with. Same yep. character, same everything. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. He has defined, like, the image yeah. of J. Jonah Jameson going forward. And, like, rightly so, because he's great. And I think he's, like, yeah, they get him super right. So there you go. Shout out to J. Jonah Jameson. He's been the one consistent thing throughout all three of these movies. So it's good stuff. All right, regarding the other villains, because we've literally only covered one of the three villains <laughs> at this point. Jesus Christ. Oh. Uh, I mean, like, Sandman is almost identical regarding his origin to the comics. He's, like, a, a crook. Basically, like a small town thief, he gets, um, in the comic, it's a nuclear testing site rather than a particle accelerator, but, like, people just love giving people superpowers through particle accelerators these days, so (laughs) that one at least made sense. The big radical change that they make for this, which I am mixed to slash not being a fan of, is the fact that they make him Uncle Ben's killer. Yeah. Um, what exactly is your opinion on that decision? Because I'm not sure if it's a good one. I like the fact that he was sort of added into that whole deal, respectively, Mm -hmm. because it sort of adds to that whole idea of looking for forgiveness, being not the person you were. I don't like that they made him specifically the killer. I would Mm -hmm. have preferred it if he was just the accomplice. Yep, I 100% agree. Pulling in his partner into the car, and that's what sets the gun off or something. Mm. Like, without him being directly right there with the gun, holding it in his hands kind of thing. Yeah, And it would have then also justified a bit more sense in Peter realizing that the symbiote was amplifying his hatred. Because, like, now he's going to try and kill a guy who was there when his uncle died, rather than being the actual killer, kind of thing. Mm, So that's my general opinion of it. Yeah, I completely agree. Like, I, I totally get the impulse to connect Peter personally to the villain in the same way that they have in all of the other movies. I think making him the killer was the bad choice. I think, because it kind of rescinds Peter of guilt as well. Like, the whole point is that Mm. he thought he could have stopped the killer of Uncle Ben and he didn't. But he never could have. Like, that was just the accomplice. Like, I really think the role should have been reversed and I think he just should have been affiliated or nearby or something like that. And just that's what snaps Peter off the deep end. Yeah, I don't know. It's just, I thought it was like that kind of weird. I don't even like the idea, even of that as well, of Peter trying to pursue one of the original killers um, of Uncle Ben, because it kind of feels like the same equivalent, if I'm going to make an analogy to Batman, it kind of feels like the equivalent of hunting down Joe Chill. Mm. Like, the who it is shouldn't necessarily matter. It is more kind of representative of Peter's arc and kind of his relationship to being Spider-Man more than it actually is about the person itself. Like, almost whoever kills... It, it more should be like just crime in New York as a concept is the thing that kills Uncle Ben rather than being anyone specifically. Mm. And so like putting a name to it, I'm just not entirely sold on, but yeah. that's just me. Also, it does mean Peter just straight up murdered a guy. Yeah. Like he thought, for... or, or he thought he murdered a guy. Thought... Um, yeah. Well, he, mm. I guess he kind of, like he fell out of the window in his own regard, but that's yeah. one of those kind of uh, in between he... things. So they can, it's, they do this a lot in comic book movies when like, Batman doesn't actually kill anyone, but a lot of people seem to die around him. Mm. (laughs) I believe it's called the Batman loophole. (laughs) Yep, yep, exactly. Personified in Batman Begins, I'm not going to kill you, but I don't have to save you. I'm like, that's kind of the same (laughs) thing. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. No, all I did was blow up the tracks of this train as it comes her Lena down to crash and inevitably kill anyone nearby. I'm not directly pulling the trigger. (laughs) Exactly. I just remotely pulled the trigger on my Batmobile. <laughs> Trains kill people, not people blowing up train tracks that kill people. Ah, <laughs> uh, oh, so dumb. Yeah. yeah. Though in this movie, like he thinks he kills Sandman at that one point. Mm. As I said again, great scene, and I think one of the good symbiote scenes when like he actually confronts Sandman in the train tracks and he's yelling about Ben Parker and everything, and they're smashing into the trains together and. I think all of that stuff is great. And the fact that he thinks he actually kills him at the end and then feels no remorse for it is like a good, interesting character moment, but it's also just kind of wasted because nothing else in the symbiote arc works. So, And the fact that he's also like, I thought you would be happy, Aunt May. Mm, Yeah, exactly. He's like, like, what the fuck? That guy's dead. 
Yeah, Why would feel, I be happy? Feel good about someone murdering someone else, all right? Especially if you stick with the theory that Aunt May knows the whole time that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. Because then he's just like, yeah, I killed a man. Oh, be yeah. happy for me. Exactly. That's exactly what I've read from that conversation as well. Mm. Like, Aunt May's like, Spider-Man doesn't kill people. Peter, you don't kill people. What the hell are you on about? <laughs> and then she immediately goes into the whole monologue about vengeance and all that, which is like... Yeah. That whole arc of, like, him forgiving Sandman and actually having to reconcile with vengeance and all that, I think that is pretty good. And I think at least they do a smart thing of trying to tie it into the symbiote stuff. But I just think, I just, there's too much elements in this movie that that isn't necessarily supported. It almost kind of gets buried, I guess. Especially since, like, it doesn't really work with the Green Goblin or New Goblin as well. Like, he never really forgives Harry. Well, I guess he kind of does, but he still treats him like like rubbish for most of the movie um, because of that. Granted, they treat each other rubbish, which is probably representative of them not liking each other in real life either, but I'm not sure how... I don't think it plays out especially well with that character. It's too many loops, I think. Sorry? Too many loops, Mm. I think. Yeah, I think that's fair. Probably worth talking about uh, the goblin in this movie as well. Um, The new goblin, which I believe he was called in the promotional material... Um, mm-hmm. Though I could be mistaken, or if you can call him like Green Goblin Two or Hobgoblin or whatever else, but I've always referred Goblin to him as Junior. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I've always referred to him as New Goblin or Skater X Goblin, mm. one of the two. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. What do you necessarily feel about how they handle Harry uh, and the character in this film? I like what they've done, considering where they were left off, mm. kind of thing. Like I think if they maybe had sort of stretched out some of these ideas to earlier movies i think it Mm. would have been a lot better that they could sort of like have a nice long running arc rather than have everything come to a head very quickly and then end very quickly as well Mm. yeah uh so like if they could have like spanned this whole thing over spider-man 2 3 and possibly 4 i think that might have been a bit better but i know you called him skate rex goblin i actually don't (laughs) mind his look in this (laughs) i i think it's okay um, and I think it makes sense that Harry would adjust the look of the Goblin yes. in some ways. I just wish it wasn't so X Games. I wish yeah. it kind of kept the monstrosity of the Goblin suit a little bit. They kind of, it smooths off too many edges for me, I guess. Uh, okay. um, even if I like the ultimate direction that they go in. That's just me at the very least. Um, completely unprecedented for the comics as well. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, he in the comics, as far as I'm aware, like, obviously Harry Osborn has always become Green Goblin 2 in the comics. Like, it's just sadly kind of inevitable that he eventually takes over his father's mantle. Mm-hmm. But he's almost always worn the exact same costume, interestingly enough. So, like, I, I enjoy the idea that they distinguish him from his father in this way visually. But I just wish there was a little bit more of a connection. Because kind of looking at the two of them side by side, you never really th- would have thought of them as father and son. Yeah. You would have thought of, like, monstrous like industrialist man and then some kid who just likes skateboarding a little bit too much <laughs> it, i mean he literally well, it's more mm. a surfboard or like a snowboard i guess more than a skateboard but you know what i mean like that kind of image so yeah as slick as it is i think the missing piece that they really need was just a mask mm. some proper like goblin mask because yep. i can see why they'd also want to like soften everything because given that at the end he basically turns good mm-hmm. and they want him to look also kind of like a hero in a sense yep but i think that all could have just been done with like just removing the mask and going from one face to his normal face kind of thing Hmm. and then that ties it in with the rest of the themes of all three movies yeah i think that makes sense i mean they're talking about masks and like who is what is the mask and what do people wear masks for and blah 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 and all that jazz so like giving him an actually goblin-esque mask which you almost see like prototypes of in the um in the lab when he, he experiments on himself like mm. you see the hobgoblin mask in there and everything which i thought was interesting so if just the original mask kind of hewned a little bit closer to the original goblin design or at least like seemed still seemed sort of demonic or monstrous in a certain way and then mm. just at the end he takes that off or he throws it aside or something like that i think you're absolutely right that really would have fixed it regarding the amnesia subplot as much as i hate any amne- amnesia subplot because they're almost always terrible and cheap <laughs> The Goblin, although this case in Norman Osborn rather than Harry Osborn, did lose his memory in the comics for a little while, so there is a precedent there technically. But also, I, as I said before, I don't really know why it's in this movie because it literally just delays the arc just a little bit because he eventually ends up finding out what half an hour later anyway. So it doesn't feel like a comic book amnesia; it feels like an OC amnesia. 
<laughs> That's a good analogy. An OC amnesia or like a Grey's Anatomy amnesia yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Or something like Home and Away. Like someone just yes. loses their memory for a few episodes or something and then comes back and is like, oh my god, I have a secret twin that's married to my cousin or something like that. I'm sure <laughs> something like that happens in that show. I've never seen Home and Away. Okay, I don't um, think they've gone full incestuous yet. Yeah, uh, <laughs> well, who knows? I can't speak to it, but probably not. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, at least in that regard, it makes sense, but also still doesn't make sense. Yeah. So, And also, just because something was in the comics doesn't mean you should do it in the movies. We've talked about plenty before. Fidelity is not what we necessarily want yes. in an adaptation. So, Yeah, I would not have been a fan if they just randomly killed Gwen Stacy in this one as well. Yeah, just no. Just because of fidelity. Especially since they just introduced her as yeah. well. Yeah, real weird. I don't even think, once again, I don't even think Gwen Stacy needs to be in this movie. Just like, mm. I don't want a love triangle. And she's yeah. just, like, there just to basically make Mary Jane jealous. Like, she serves no other function. And she's literally just... It's a female character being added to make another female character jealous, which is just, yep. ugh, not a fan. And, look, Bryce Dallas Hallowood, I think, is a great director. She's gone into TV recently and all that as well. She directed a couple of great episodes in The Mandalorian. I've never liked her as an actress um, in this or Jurassic World or anything else I've seen her in. So, you know, and also there's a kind of gross nepotism thing in that her father is Ron Howard, like, legendary director of Apollo 11, Ron Howard. So, like, eh, I don't know. I would have been more than okay if she was just completely cut, so. Uh, yeah, no, I can, yeah, I'm with you on this one. Uh, the performance wasn't fantastic. Mm -hmm. I probably don't have the same amount of hatred. It's not hatred. Acting. It's not hatred. It's indifference. There's indifference, a big difference. Yeah. There's a big difference to a difference. Um, yeah, I just like... Well, I, I wanted to become a good director, basically. That's where she seems to be going right oh, now yeah, anyway. Yeah. So. Uh, I totally yeah. see that. But yeah, like yeah. after watching her and things like Black Mirror, I do actually like some of her performances. Yeah, yeah. look, she's she's more okay in Black Mirror than I've seen in other stuff. I'll give you that. So, In terms of this film, yeah, unnecessary, unneeded. The only thing interesting I found about her character in this production is the fact that basically she switched hair with Kirsten Dunst. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That she's a natural redhead and Kirsten Dunst is a yes. natural blonde. <laughs> so theoretically, they should have been playing each other, which I think was very funny. Um, and I do. Yeah, I but I think that's very uh, telling of what I think of the performance when that factoid <laughs> that I found on IMDb. Mm -hmm. is the best part of the character <laughs> is the most interesting thing she's got going yeah, yeah yeah probably not probably not a great idea you know we've we've barely even mentioned mary jane so far in this movie <laughs> i mean there's well, so much yeah. other stuff what, going on like what else is there to say uh <laughs> she's still here she, she gets kidnapped again at the end <laughs> Yep. That's pretty much it. Uh, her relationship with Peter is, like, starts off well, at least. But mm. then, as usual, miscommunication, they end up hating each other. I... See, this is the thing in this movie as well, the other thing that I didn't like. But, like, Mary Jane does not deserve... Sorry, Peter Parker does not deserve Mary Jane. Peter Parker is such mm. a prick of a boyfriend yeah. for the first half an hour to an hour of this movie. He is a jerk even before he gets the black suit. Which is, like, the same problem with Eddie Brock. Like, it just doesn't work. Yeah. He is so self-absorbed and self-involved and completely unsupportive of her. And, like, the entire time when they start falling apart, I'm like, yeah, deservedly so. Mary Jane should mm. dump this asshole. Yeah, that scene where he basically says, wait, she got fired and became a jazz waitress and she told you and not me. I'm like, you've had, like, how many days to weeks has this happened? Like, this was quite early on. You, If you were any sort of attentive or any sort of uh, boyfriend, you probably would have found out. Yeah, early. yeah, just a little bit. Yeah, I just don't think, like, I, I don't love the love triangle. I hate the forced melodrama that they had between the two of them. I don't think they should have ended up together again as well. And even, like, Harry giving him, giving Peter his blessing to finally be with Mary Jane and all that just... Is like weird considering they were never really like they kind of get together quickly again in this movie, but also not really. And it's like, ah, oh, it's just a mess. It just mm -hmm. chews up screen time and made me actively hate or actively dislike Peter Parker in the opening in this movie, quite frankly. Because, like, also, I mean, like, it's such a non Spider Man thing for everything to be going right for him. So I think seeing Peter in that environment is interesting and then is seeing it immediately undercut. But, mm -hmm. like, 
I wanted things to start going wrong for him because he was being such a prick about it, <laughs> which is not the position I sh- you should be in. So I literally have it in my comics. I'm reading here right now. Peter's a bad listener and insufferable. And then emo Peter Parker is just as bad as I remember and still almost not as insufferable as previous Peter Parker, but still pretty insufferable. Gives a bad name to both jazz and emo. <laughs> exactly. Now dig on this. Boom. I gotta stop doing that. (laughs) Oh, also, how in that final scene where he walks back into the jazz bar to see Mary Jane singing, how did the bodyguards not immediately just go, nope, not you again. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. That's because no one recognized him because his hair is up. Obviously, he doesn't have the the flop down, whatever that thing's called. Uh, Because he's like a completely different person now, obviously. Mm -hmm. It's so dumb. And the fact that Mary Jane is like, at the very beginning, she's singing in the play about how amazing being in love is. In love is, and then, then he, at the end of the movie, she's saying, "She's singing, I fell in love, but I'm never going to fall again because it sucks." And I'm like, "Yeah, then why are you still with him? Stop <laughs> dancing with him. Leave. He doesn't like you. Don't deserve. You don't deserve yeah. all of this crap. Punch him back and leave. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, he did. He slapped her. Yeah, like that's pretty horrifying. It, like he went full Hank Pym." Yeah, ex- oh, Jesus. If you want to talk about a brutal reference, yeah, God, okay. Hank Pym, the wife beater. Yeah, and like, alien symbiote be damned or anything, but like, there's too much baggage there. I mean, just mm. no, no, leave her alone. Go, yeah. Peter, go ruin Gwen Stacy's life. Yeah, exactly. Like, go you inevitably dump- will. Go dump all your insecurities on him, on her. <laughs> Is there anything else worth talking about? Spider Man 3, the references, like any of the other comic stuff? I think. I mean, there's a lot in this movie, bits and pieces of it, I think, are comic accurate. A lot of the comic accurate stuff, curiously, in this film, I think is quite good. Like, a lot of the Sandman stuff. The, what's the name, The when he gets rid of the symbiote sequence in the Bell Tower, I think that's great. And probably the most Raimi-esque scene. But outside of that, it's just like, as I said at the top, I think there are good elements in here, but there's just, they're so kind of, like, shackled by all of these bad like choices and subplots and everything like that and just overstuffed that it just yeah. it's overall i just can't really recommend it as a decent movie even if i like bits and pieces and i don't think it's sam raimi's fault either i think it's kind of the producers kind of got to him which is why he didn't direct spider-man 4 after this i think it can easily be summed up by the opening title sequence is mm. it looks cool it had good ideas but it's overstuffed took too long and was crammed in with too many multiple stories and flashbacks and things <laughs> i like the opening title sequence <laughs> i like it too but like there's a point where it just goes okay one it's dragging on a little bit mm. and two they to me they lose some of the creepiness of like the black symbiote it was like really cool seeing it go along the webs and thing and then they just have this whole little mini section just in the middle where it looks like an xbox loading screen <laughs> yeah just a, a little bit I'll, I'll give you that i just mostly like um uh, the score of that sequence as well and like it's not done by um danny elfman who did the previous films because he had a bit of a falling out with sam raimi after spider-man 2 i think it's christopher young does this film yeah. with additional music by danny elfman because he was reusing a lot of his stuff but i really like christopher young's um uh, symbiote theme especially but also the sandman theme too like yes. the symbiote theme sticks in my brain almost just as much as the original spider-man theme like especially that moment when he wakes up on the side of the building and you hear the like it's just it's good stuff and i like that in yes. the opening title sequence as well and i also like the way that they implement the symbiote as connected to all of like all of peter's negative memories so, like, you mm. see a moment when, like, Mary, like um, Uncle Ben is killed and he's chasing the killer. And, like, the symbiote is kind of bubbling off the side of that. I'm like, oh, I think that's kind of, like, clever thematically and visually interesting. But it is, like, over, over long and overall. Like, I will agree in that regard. And then they throw in, on top of the symbiote stuff, the Sandman stuff of where it's, like, his theme kicks in. So all the titles turn to dust, turn mm. to sand and blow off. And yeah, that was, like, a bit, that was a bit much. Yeah. I'm like, I like it, but stick to one or the other. Mm. Don't try and cram in both. It's like the movie. Which was the issue with the movie. (laughs) Yeah, there you go. There you go. In that regard, I already feel like we've kind of touched on it a little bit, but we might as well move into do it differently then, shall we? Yes. Yes. So how would you do it differently? Jingle. Oh, yes. Jingle, 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 jingle. jingle. How dare you not do the jingle? 
I was just trying to get the nice segue in. It was a good segue. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Um, Anyway, uh, shall I go first this week then? If you've already... Sure, go for it. I mean, I feel like I've already touched on a lot of this, but like cut everything symbiote related. Cut Gwen Stacy. Just leave it Sandman and New Goblin. Cut the amnesia subplot. (laughs) What I basically want to do is keep all of the good elements, I think, of this movie Mm -hmm. and then just have a a rest of a good movie to tie all of them together so you can have a lot of the similar arcs of like um spider-man spider-man seeking vengeance against sandman you know for being connected to uncle ben's murder i would like if they tied in um the way he reacts to harry as well like i think would be really great in the opening scene or something like that if harry does something almost unforgivable like i don't know threatens aunt may or something like that which leaves Peter like down a similar path of like vengeance essentially um which ties the two villains together more specifically I want to kind of cut a lot of the love interest stuff with Mary Jane honestly I'm not really sure what she would do in this film outside of all of that stuff but like I don't know give her an interesting or different subplot that is not connected to getting jealous about another woman because that's just bad turn her into black cat I mentioned this in previous ones turn her into black cat (laughs) yeah I would love that idea if I was not already trying to cut characters from the movie, so, like, adding in another supervillain, maybe, oh, maybe She doesn't not. become the black cat until mm. the next movie. Just start oh, okay. her, like, just her occasionally cut to her in the gym. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> not, like, randomly stealing stuff or something like that? No, no, just getting in superhero chic. <laughs> No, oh, okay. Yeah, fair enough. Why With not? With no explanation. <laughs> <laughs> just casually, like a 20-minute scene of just her working out on the gym. Yeah. Um, why not? Yeah. Yeah, and I just feel like I, I think it would have made for a, a decent film. Maybe not as good as Spider-Man 2, because I think, like, if you want to make a film as strong as Spider-Man 2, you would almost kind of need to start from the ground up, which I think you would have had to do if, like, Vulture was the villain or something like that. But yeah. I think that there is a way to salvage pieces of Spider-Man 3 cut a lot of the things, streamline it, and actually make something decent. So that's, that is what I would... I would do the differentlies. Would definitely piss off Avi Arid, but I would consider that a moral victory, so... Um, Fair enough. Yep. Well, for my do it differently, uh, strap in everyone, because this is going to be another long, rambly, stuttery, complete overhaul from Ev. Woohoo! I am here I- for you, and here to support... <laughs> Uh, whatever this ends up being. You may have said that a little too early because I am going to try and make a decent story that includes the Sandman, New Goblin, the Symbiote Suit, and Eddie Brock. Oh my god, you're a monster. Yes, I am. <laughs> so, All right, lay it on me. I'm, I'm in interested ver- now. In my version of Spider-Man 3, we have a shorter title sequence with the Symbiote, no Sandman stuff yet. ba 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 da Sorry. Uh, and basically the opening scene is just straight in with the action it is the remnants of a space shuttle hurtling down very good yep basically what happens in every other incarnation of screen venom yep yep uh have it come down with uh jameson in the uh shuttle Mm -hmm. you're not going to turn him into man wolf in this movie as well are you i'm not oh thank god (laughs) he's literally in just for this opening scene as a brief cameo okay i can allow that can he be looking at his like wedding ring longingly still on his hand or something like that just really hammering home (laughs) possibly i thought that could all be covered by just recasting him as uh james marsden (laughs) (laughs) yes yeah great idea great idea so yeah he comes down spider-man comes to the rescue big heroic thing this is where you say everyone loves spider-man yay mm-hmm. and that's and you sort of have the symbiote coming out of like the machinery sort of stuff because mm. you've got to tie it into the fact that every villain in spider-man is basically science gone wrong mm-hmm. yeah or in this case so, space gone wrong <laughs> yes but you can still have like it be tied in with it was from space which is sciencey because it came down in the shuttle and mm. Man should never go to God's domain. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> or whatever. I will point out briefly as a quick tangent, but um, the mm. ultimate version of uh, Spider-Man, which was like the ultimate version of Eddie Brock has a few similarities, but that version of the symbiote, I believe, was a cure for cancer, which went huh. like horribly wrong or something like that, which ties in, as you were saying, to like science gone awry, which is a classic Spider-Man um, like theme. So, but anyway, I just threw that out there. But I, yeah. I personally kind of like the idea of it being an alien, but um, that's just me. 
Maybe I'm just nostalgic. So yeah, uh, then you cut to basically everything with Sandman's origin, because mm-hmm. I just like that. I think that's done really well for his whole uh, mutation, escaping, getting mutated, being able to hold on because of his uh, sick child. Mm-hmm. That keep that. That scene is then amazing. You, yep. Yep. Uh, then you jump to Peter and MJ, uh, like as a proper couple, actually just enjoying themselves for once. You could not, like, for this entire movie, they do not break up. Thank God. They, in fact, get stronger as a couple. Like, they have their a few arguments and a few squabbles, but nothing that, like, mm. really derails them. Peter doesn't act like a pe- petulant child throughout most of yep. it. Yep. <laughs> Thank God. Yep, great. Yeah. Like, they're just doing coupley stuff, uh, and he's confiding in her and, uh, about being Spider-Man. Mm. Like, that kind of thing. He, he's finally got someone he can, like share this sort of burden with and she's helping him like she's totally okay because yeah you're out saving people and i'll help you with the police radio if you need and stuff. Ah, there you go gal in the chair <laughs> yeah kind of mm. although she's of course doing her own thing she also doesn't get fired because like at this point her I, I don't want her to suffer the like humiliation conga in mm. the same way peter does yep because that just feels like rubbing like, it served no real purpose. Just dropped extra salt in the wound. Mm-hmm. That was Mary Jane's life <laughs> at that point. And her job just basically goes to the background. Mm. I would have... Spider-Man goes off to save Gwen Stacy. I would still have her in there. Uh, have her be, like, a the student, uh, a friend of Peter. But not... Uh, neither of them, like, actually... Are flirty and like each other there's no love in that they're just friends mm, okay kind of thing he goes to save gwen stacy it is discovered that that entire sort of crane being broken was a trap laid by new goblin mm. and harry because mm-hmm. he's pissed it went a little too far he was not expecting it to go that far but it it served its purpose and basically you have that scene of them fighting in the alleyway and they're basically going at each other and it ends in a bit of a stalemate they both just leave like uh leave to lick their wounds kind of thing Mm -hmm. so you're clear that harry is still a jerk face but it's sort of implied that neither of them really wants to actually try and do the job kind of thing and like actually take the other one down Mm -hmm. so that ends in a little bit of a stalemate you can then introduce eddie brock in as a returning journalist because that's the weird thing that irked me for some reason like they name check eddie in the first movie Mm -hmm. as their photographer who is no longer who is off on like assignments in that case just bring him back from assignments (laughs) yeah exactly like don't introduce him as a new person say oh yeah we know eddie he was a reference that's his nuts yeah yeah, yeah I totally and agree. have him already in the salary job. Like, he is a proper renowned uh, photojournalist. Mm. Uh, he is not an arsehole. Yep. Like, he is s- slight cocky attitude, but that is to be expected in an anti-hero, basically. Sure, yep. So, and that's how you sort of play him off. And he is actually dating Gwen Stacy, like, properly. Mm. And for the rest, and for the whole movie, the couple of Eddie and Gwen basically act as a parallel to Peter and MJ, as basically their life if Peter hadn't become Spider-Man kind of thing. Hmm, okay. Eddie is basically Peter, but without the Parker bad luck kind of thing. Mm. It's at this point you can have the symbiote start, like, forming, start attaching. Like, before any of the hatred happens, it like starts becoming part of the suit but not fully black it's like taken on the li- the black lines and made them darker so it's sort of hidden in the suit and slowly starts like throughout the movie starts like spreading out to eventually becomes the full black suit kind of thing yep is sure. what i'm imagining mm-hmm. and at the start it just makes spider-man more badass he just starts he's better at his job he's still like saving people being all happy he's just like oh this is like I'm just stronger than before. There he, like, tries to fight Sandman, but Sandman, instead of always getting in the way of the cops and stuff, he just basically is trying to be a little thief that, like, takes what he needs and then slips up in the distance. So you always see him sort of in the background kind of thing, running away. Spider-Man tries to stop him, uh, and he's like, yeah, I've, I've stopped you. you go to the police, and he eventually escapes and stuff. I don't know if you're following that. Entirely. No, no, no. Yeah, no, I know what you yeah. mean at the very least. Yeah. 
cool. Yeah. So he's always just like, he's that sort of like, I'm just doing the bare minimum I have to to save my daughter. Mm, kind sure. Of thing. Yep. Classic like villain, but for the right reasons, essentially. Yep. Anti villain. Yeah, basically. Yeah. 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 Uh, you can have another battle between Harry and Peter. Mm-hmm. This time, there's a bit. It goes on for a bit longer, and Harry manages to get the upper hand and is about to like try and stab Peter again, but hesitates and is just like like in his in his own justification. It's like you need to suffer more, but really, it's because he can't actually bring himself to kill his best friend. Mm-hmm. Also, he's new goblin purely by. Uh, new tech. He doesn't get the same uh, green mist that his father did. Mm, okay. The vapor injection. It is just he has been fueled by uh, his hatred, what he thinks his father would want, and his new tech that allows him to battle Spider Man, basically. Okay. Interesting. Spider Man continues his search for Sandman and beating up guys. This time he starts getting a bit more aggressive. Slowly, the, the black suit actually starts tendrilling out to being almost the full black suit now Mm -hmm. and he sort of noticed it but he's like oh that's just kind of it's a cool new enhancement come from courtesy of nasa or whatever (laughs) sure yeah yeah. (laughs) like he just assumes it's part of the space like it come like the symbiote could become like attached with like a thank you note or something oh (laughs) it's like attached does the symbiote write the thank you note as well (laughs) no no that there was something else but you know in classic Oh, mistaken. I see. He, he, mis- the he misinterpreted. Has hitched a ride with the thing. Right. Okay. It's become ooh, interesting. Yeah. You could potentially make it as well on that the symbiote is essentially messing with his perception, like kind of it normalizing to the fact that his. I mean, this is the thing. Like, it, it's almost yeah. perceived as a symbiotes are like a na- natural occurrence necessarily. So Peter just perceives mm. it as kind of sort of kind of like a natural yeah. just creature or design, I guess, or something along those lines. I don't know. I'm sure there's a way yeah. to play that. And so he's becoming. Uh, because of the symbiote he's becoming more arrogant and stuff he doesn't go full emo he's just less ca- like it's not enhancing any emotions it's dampening emotions oh interesting i so don't mind that be- yeah so yeah he just becomes less caring in like oh okay that's more collateral damage that's okay mm. sort of thing sure and i mean actual collateral damage not american collateral damage wait what american collateral damage of you know, civilians. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. In this particular case, it's just, oh, some cars broke and stuff. Okay, yeah, no, fair, fair. Yeah, I wasn't sure what you were referring to for a moment. I was like, wait a minute, is there yeah. a moment in the movie or something that he let someone die and I just didn't remember? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. fair. Yeah, no, uh, basically, he, this is whole thing is happening. Uh, Mary Jane's plotline is basically she is trying to get Peter and Harry, because she doesn't know that Harry is New Goblin now. Hmm. Uh, so she's just trying to basically mend that bridge mm-hmm. so she's running between the two of them uh, being the only voice of reason in mm-hmm. all of this once again the only functioning human being <laughs> yes yep. exactly this basically leads to the third battle between uh, a now fully black suited spider-man and new goblin mm-hmm. and and spider-man just breaks harry he just throws him down is like raining punches mm. is like that fight with sandman in the train it's like that basically. oh i like Just that yeah that's good one-sided beat down mm-hmm. and he's about to basically finish off harry when harry's mask sort of comes off mm. fully broken now and and it's norman harry... osborne no sorry <laughs> <laughs> how did you know no. <laughs> but he sees harry's face he sees he's got mj's voice in the back of his head and that's the moment where he's like, what is this doing? Mm. Runs off to the church, mm. breaks off the symbiote suit, disposes of it. It just like sinks away. Mm. Maybe a little, uh, yeah, just sort of, just you don't see it anymore. Okay. Oh, really? It, so there's no venom or? No venom in this movie. Oh, I like that. I like that as, a, as yeah. an arc. Yeah, good stuff. Okay. Yeah, and so he goes back to trying to be your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, but now he has a final battle with Sandman, who has now basically been slipping away, and because Spider-Man has been more brutal and has been focused with Goblin, the police are just have gone full ham on getting Sandman, and he's just like, he's defending himself, but it's escalated so much that now he is just seen as a giant monster. 
Mm. And he is doing the best. He's just taking on as much power as he can just to try and protect himself and his family kind of Mm. thing. And so you have the big battle of Spider-Man and New Green Goblin as a good guy because there'll be like a little scene where the butler Mm. is basically like, no, you must continue fighting Spider-Man. Think about your father. Think about everything. It's like, why do you care so much? It's like, I've put too much work. I have I saw your father die with his blades. I will not let you fail the same way he failed. Because mm. I found that ridiculous that the brothers just like, yeah, I'm finally telling you now after all this time. Yep. That, you know, it, I will point out quickly that we didn't talk about it, but in an earlier draft of the script, um, the butler was supposed to be a figment of Harry's imagination or like he's kind of like a symptom of the goblin formula essentially so oh, okay. rather than the butler telling him at the end it's implied that it's just harry finally confronting the truth himself um which oh. i think works a lot better but that's just clearly not the interpretation they go for in the movie so that probably would have been better yeah yeah but seeing as i got rid of the goblin mist i'm, I'm now just sticking with the butler was actually just the one pushing harry the entire time to it, be more goblin like it, it was the butler all along <laughs> Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> no, no. Spider Man's beating down uh, the new goblin like earlier on something, and mm-hmm. tears off the mask, and it was the butler the entire time. <laughs> was it Norman Osborn? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Love it. But yeah, and then that's the turning point that Harry's like, "Why would you let me live this life? Why would you let me kill myself for mm. this stupid thing? He's my best friend." And that's this realization. They go, they fight Sandman, they make a big spectacle of it for the people, but eventually just let sandman go and it's like i i forgive you for being near my uncle when he died (laughs) doesn't have the same resonance does it as if you say it like that but that kind of thing and Mm. that's the end it eventually you can have a little sequel hook of like a little bit of the symbiote just landing in eddie's camera Mm -hmm. because that will be in a perfect world this will actually be a better movie than what we got this won't piss off Sam Raimi mm. and will lead to a Spider-Man 4 in where you have Spider-Man and New Goblin taking on Venom and Mysterio. Mm. Mysterio and have a whole played, played by, by Bruce Campbell. Very good. Just making sure. Just making yes. sure. Yep. And have that whole movie about dealing with like what all the what ifs, what could have been kind of thing. Mm. And so you're dealing with evil Spider-Man and a guy who forms realities and like perception and stuff can you deal with your past Mm. because venom is the evilness of spider-man's past mysterio is the thing that he missed Mm. the entire time and he was there all along yeah (laughs) yeah and goblin is literally like i'm trying to be here now but all the people seem to remember is the fact that my dad was an asshole and i tried to kill people with a crane (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah i like that yeah yeah and that's basically what it is cool Good stuff. No, I like a lot of those changes. I think um, I think it very much illustrates that point that there are redeemable elements in this movie. They just kind of need to be put together in a different way. I think you've very much proved that. Good stuff. Whew. And I love the idea of t- like doing Black Suit in one movie and then Venom in the next movie. I think that I think that structure just works so much better than trying to put it all into one. Considering Venom is only Venom for the last, what, 20 minutes of the film? Yeah. Um, and it- then it allows you to properly... You've already introduced Eddie. Now you can focus on his actual fall from grace mm. yeah kind of like properly absolutely have him then break up with gwen stacy have him then mm. deal with all that stuff and if you really want three villains make gwen stacy black cat <laughs> i'm on this you were so on board with making black cat a thing felicia hardy she... is a character in her own right thank you very much <laughs> i know but i just want to see her in a movie <laughs> I she gets shafted yeah, so much <laughs> me too we were really close to having um, Felicity Jones playing Black Cat in An Amazing Spider-Man 3. Yes. Just didn't happen. We'll talk about that in a later episode, as I'm sure you're aware. So, yeah. yes, no, I know. Black I, Cat deserves more. Black Cat is a good character, and I am kind of disappointed that she doesn't... She isn't, like, a mainstream kind of character in the same way that, like, Catwoman is for Batman fans. But no, she's really good. So, um, cool. No, good stuff. <laughs> and look, I couldn't turn Gwen Stacy into Spider Gwen Jesse. I don't think that's happened in the comic series. Not, at that point. Not in... Look, theoretically, if Spider-Man 4 was to happen, it would have come out in 2010, maybe. I don't think it had happened oh, at that point. I'm not sure. I no. think it was 2014, but I could be wrong. Yeah, that sounds about right. So, no, absolutely right. But, hey, they could have pioneered it for the movie. Who knows? So, I mean, I'm all on board with just having Spider-Gwen and everything. So, you know, yeah. that, that's just me. 
Well, uh, shall we move into random recommendations then? Yeah, sure. Yeah. What have you got? Damn it! I was about to say that oh, you're turning it all around this episode. I know. It's uh, usually I'm the one that's first. I know, it's messing with my brain. God, okay. Um, uh, well, now I guess it's my turn to have a slightly lengthy response um, in that I'm not sure if I've recommended it before, but I've definitely harped on about it before, but this just feels like the perfect time for it. But I'm going to recommend Spectacular Spider-Man. I've, I've probably brought it up a number of times, but Spectacular Spider-Man is to Spider-Man what Batman the Animated Series is to Batman. In my mind, like, I feel like it is the kind of the definitive take on Spider-Man outside of the comics. It ran, I think it was like the late 2000s to the early 2010s. It only got two seasons because it was cancelled after Disney acquired Marvel, which is, I think, is like the biggest crime in humanity because I think the show is really incredible. I think it does such a fantastic job with almost every single Spider-Man character. It, like, updates some of them and, like, kind of retools others while keeping others classic. The version of Venom and the black suit that they do for this is fantastic. Not only since Eddie Brock is a character from, like, almost episode one. In this, he plays almost like a an older brother role to Peter and that they went to the same primary school together and were friends. But Eddie Brock is such a bigger and more imposing guy than Peter that he basically protected him through secondary school. They can, they, like, they refer to each other as brother and everything like that and they start off the show like incredibly close and then you just slowly watch over episode after episode where peter apparently makes selfish decision after selfish decision even though it's largely because he's spider-man that eddie just grows to resent him at which point he becomes venom and then just that whole uh sequence the, whole, the season ends basically with him it's so good uh they dedicate an entire episode to the bell tower scene and that, like, it's Peter trying to rip off the symbiote, but it's also kind of going him going through his dreamscape and actually, like, engaging with a lot of the people from his past and all of his guilt and so on and so forth. Kind of like a... It's a, it's a therapy session brought on by the symbiote, which is how he gets rid of it. Um, And it's just really great. I just think... I'm so sad this show was cancelled after two seasons, because really, I just think it's... It's incredible. It nails the tone and the comedy and just so many of the different characters. It's like... I don't know. I love it. There's, there's, I cannot say enough good things about the show. And now just watching it again, I just want to go watch it for like the seventh time, I think. So it's only like 24 episodes since it's only two seasons or 26 episodes, maybe. So it doesn't take a lot to get through. Um, and I would heavily, heavily recommend it because I think it is very good. Very nice. For my random recommendation, I, I'm almost certain that I've recommended this before in a previous episode, mm-hmm. but I will do it again because... It fits and we with make, this episode. And we make the mm-hmm. rules. And we make the rules here. Yeah. You can't tell us what to do. <laughs> but please do send in your tips and recommendations and suggestions to our email. Mediumshift.gbail.com. Yes, please and thank you. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, I will go with basically the best Venom origin story there is. And that it, that we've seen on the silver screen. And that is... Upgrade. Oh, God. I really thought you were going to say the Venom movie for a second, and I was freaking out. <laughs> I think you have recommended Upgrade before, but I think it deserves yes. to be recommended again. So Yes, it is. So I And on top of that, I do actually recommend Venom, in a sense. Mm, well, are we going to do an episode on Venom? I don't know if we decided to or not, uh, but I think we should. It is a that's spin-off. That's up to you guys. Is it? <laughs> Our audience. I mean, we lit- email in. We literally just said we make the rules, to. but <laughs> okay, <laughs> sure, why not? Uh, no, we'll decide later on yeah. if you care strongly enough about it. Either way, to email us, Please we will take it into account. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, we've um, got a few episodes to get through. Very anyway. small, uh, but yeah, no, I actually do. Yeah, I'll briefly touch on this. I upgrade is the better version of Venom. Mm-hmm. And I do think you should watch Upgrade. And That's literally all I'll say about it. <laughs> and Australian. And it's Australian. It yeah. was filmed in Melbourne. It's directed by Lee Winnell, which is all great. Even though I think it's supposed to be set in, like, San Francisco or, or Los Angeles or something like that. Random American yeah, city. Future escape but... version of that, so no one cares. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, exactly. No one cares. In my heart, it's, it's Australian. In that I literally recognise some of the streets that it was filming <laughs> on. So, which was trippy. And now I understand why the rest of the world gets excited when they see themselves on screen. <laughs> yeah, no, I'd second that. I think Upgrade is great. 
It's been a while since I've seen it, actually. I should watch it again. Well, thank you to everyone who listened to this episode of Medium Shift. We can be found at mediumshift at gmail.com. Feel free to send in all of your symbiotic or parasitic alien hosts just for us to check them out for science. Next episode, we are actually getting to our first proper Spider-Man reboot, which I am both excited for and vaguely dreading in that I haven't seen this film since it came out in cinemas, and I'm not super excited to revisit it, but we'll see. We're looking at the amazing Spider-Man. Amazing Spider-Man. Tobey Maguire is finally gone. Bye-bye, sucker. Didn't miss you. Um, Yeah, so until then, fare thee well. Dig on this. Bow, 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 bow. Bow, 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 bow,